I'm a professor of religion at the University of Florida, where I also direct the Center for Global Islamic Studies. And this event today is part of a larger project um, that has been funded by the Henry Luce Foundation Initiative on a Global Religion uh, or Religion and International Affairs. And that project is called Islam in Africa in Global Context. And we have been organizing a series of lectures, workshops, and summer institutes. Uh, and this year's theme uh, for this project is media. And this project has always sought to bring the study of religion in Africa into dialogue with the study of other religions, but also uh, Islam in other parts of the world. And so that's why uh, we wanted to launch this particular workshop uh, with a uh, discussion about Islam elsewhere. So the, the workshop tomorrow is Islam Media and Popular Culture and African Elsewhere. And we will begin uh, with this presentation by Yusuf Saeed, South Asia as Print Center of Islamic Popular Art in the early 20th century. Before I give the floor to Yusuf Saeed, let me tell you a bit about him. He is an independent scholar and filmmaker uh, who is based in New Delhi. And he has written extensively uh, and has produced a number of important documentaries about the art and cultural traditions of South Asia. His notable films include Hayal Darpan and Basant, excuse the pronunciation, and these films have been shown around the world. I don't know if they're available uh, with subtitles. He is also author of the important book, Muslim Devotional Art in India, which was reissued in 2019. He has also co-founded a digital archive of South Asian popular visual culture called Tasvir Gaal. And I think he will tell us about that. Before uh, Yusuf speaks, let me briefly introduce the roundtable speakers uh, who will uh, speak directly after Yusuf. The first speaker is Shobana Shankar, who is a historian of West Africa and African Indian entanglements. And she is a professor at Stony Brook University. Her latest book looks at how Indians and Africans have negotiated their complicated relationships in spheres such as religion, science, and education. And that book is forthcoming. She's also the author of Who Shall Enter Paradise, Christian Origins in Muslim Nigeria. And she has co-edited two um, books, one about the Sudan interior mission, the Protestant mission that has, was very important in Sub-Saharan Africa, and another edited book, Religions on the Move, New Dynamics of religion exp Religious Expansion in the Globalizing World. The second roundtable speaker is our colleague at the University of Florida, Ali Mia, who is Assistant Professor of Religion, as well as the Iza Hassan Sheikh Fellow in Islamic Studies. Ali's work has been published in Islamic Law and Society, History of Religions, Dare Islam, Kipal, and Reorient. He's currently work working on two book manuscripts. The first, Muslims in South Asia, which is forthcoming with Edinburgh University Press, and a second book about Ashraf Ali Tanvi, and genres of world making in modern South Asian Islam. He's also the editor of the Bruce Lawrence Reader, which will appear very soon. So welcome to everyone. And I will now give the floor to Yusuf Saeed. Hello, uh, thanks a lot. Um, Good morning and good afternoon, good evening, I should say, because people are <laughs> watching this all over the world. I suppose in India, it's 
9 p.m. So um, this presentation that I'm going to give you, it's based on uh, uh, the studies that I have done in the past few years, although I'm not a formal uh, scholar in the sense that I, I, I mean, I don't really teach uh, or do uh, research in a formal way, but I've been collecting a lot of artwork. What I'm going to talk about today is actually uh, difficult to put in that formal, uh, uh, formal sense of art, as in art which is collected by people and kept in museums or uh, galleries or something like that. It's the art or the ephemera which uh, people use um, in their day-to-day -day lives, in their, especially in their religious uh, lives. And uh, so I've been collecting some of this uh, poster art or calendar art. And um, uh, besides my own work on, on Islamic popular art, uh, I and a few other colleagues, uh, we combined our energies and, and started this uh, digital archive called the Tasveer Ghar, which means house of pictures which includes um, you know, images from various collections uh, because you know this kind of artwork, you don't really find it in a museum or an art gallery. It's, it's a very transient, it's a very uh, ephemeral art. You see it one day and the next day it disappears or, or something else takes its place. So uh, I've been looking at some of this artwork and uh, what I'm going to present today is this idea that South Asia or India uh, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, uh, this entire region has been a center of production or the center of print for a lot of this Islamic uh, popular art. And not only for its, its the, 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 the very region of South Asia, but the images produced in this region have gone uh, outside and, and, you know, in many places. And in fact, since uh, tomorrow you're going to have this workshop on Africa and elsewhere, I found a few, uh, few connections with Africa as well. So I'm going to show you a whole lot of images. So let me basically uh, switch to my slideshow. Um, and then we'll go forth. Okay, I hope you can see the slides. So, uh, you know, there is this whole question uh, that uh, there is a popular myth or a belief that uh, Muslims do not take images seriously or they do not believe in the, in the use of images. Uh, and, and some Muslims you will find who are uh, completely uh, against the use of images, especially for a, for a, for a devotional purpose. Yet we see such a diverse, um, you know, production of images, especially the devotional images, that it's 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 really something uh, the mind-boggling when you see the the amount of images that have been produced in in Muslim societies, uh, especially after the uh, the coming of the printing press. Uh, uh, apart from the other religions, I mean, Islamic uh, images have been produced abundantly. And some of those images I'm going to uh, show you. So basically, when we talk of India or South Asia, um, most of these images are available or, or they are being sold on the streets, uh, on these uh, kind of street vendors uh, that are selling uh, poster art, calendar art. And it's not just the religious images. It's, it's, it's this popular visual culture which contains uh, cinema images and and you know these beautiful women or or babies cute babies or or all kinds of very interesting uh, quiche kind of images that you see and of course uh, the Hindu religious images and all other uh, religion uh, are are featured and Islamic images are of course there and many of these pictures or items the devotional items are sold on the streets uh, outside the shrines outside either the Sufi shrines or some large mosques or some kind of some kind of historical monument which is uh, visited by people uh, who are coming for a let's say a religious pilgrimage so they need images and these kind of items visual items uh, for their da daily lives 
And so these are uh, things that are available outside. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of very interesting paraphernalia, all kinds of interesting uh, uh, material that you find. There are images, there are um, talismans, there are, um, you know, of course, Mecca and Medina, and there is calligraphy, and there is even pieces of, uh, you know, architecture from Mecca and Medina. All these things have been produced by uh, by industry not only in south asia but even outside south asia and they they they, they circulate all over islamic world now i have been focusing mostly on the poster art so um, this poster art even though it is islamic but you should uh, uh, you know i should i should inform you that a lot of this art is actually being produced by uh, uh, artists and producers who are not necessarily Muslim by faith. So the entire industry in India, for example, um, is, of course, uh, Hindu images are predominant, so their producers are also Hindu, but they are producing the Islamic images as well. And there is a vice versa. There are, you know, there are Muslim uh, artists who are doing the Hindu images and there are Hindu artists who are doing the Muslim images. So it's a very interesting visual uh, industry that 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 is producing these kind of images, and as you can see in this poster, there's a very interesting uh, juxtaposition of various symbols that is happening. And the one unique symbol which you will probably find in South Asia, I don't know, I haven't seen much uh, in in other places in the world. It is this number 786, the numerical 786, which translates to Bismillah Rahman Rahim in terms of you know when you translate when you put a number with every letter alif ba ta and then you add them together so the bismillah rahman rahim comes to number 786 and that has been used as a as a symbol for good luck and 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 you know protection and all kinds of things so here you know it has been used a lot in 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 popular uh, visual culture my question was always, uh, where did the images of Mecca and Medina really come from? You know, how did they come into Indian uh, print industry? You know, how did Indians or South Asians imagine uh, Mecca and Medina? So I looked at uh, some of the past. Uh, so I looked at some of the past images and I found that you know, some of the earliest uh, images of uh, Mecca and Medina that <clears throat> were produced were uh, in the form of Hajj certificates. Because when you go to a Hajj, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people wanted these documents that certified that they have performed the Hajj. So many of these Hajj documents, Hajj certificates were available in uh, in arabia uh, after uh, after the hajj and as you can see in this particular document the rest of it is in, in uh, written in black but right at the bottom there is a text which is actually in red and that is the handwritten uh, name of the pilgrim who visited mecca and and got this uh, certificate sometimes people uh, who are very old or ailing could not go for hajj pilgrimage but they had the money so they could send uh, others on, on their behalf. So when someone else goes on your behalf and comes back after doing Hajj, how do you make sure that they have actually done, your, uh, done the Hajj? So they get the certificate uh, from there certifying that, yes, I have done Hajj. And these certificates have been available since quite, uh, you know, almost 13th, 14th century. This is, of course, a very late certificate. A lot of them were printed in Turkey. So there are many other kind of certificates. Uh, some of them are in uh, kind of in a in a scroll form. Uh, so they have the diagrams of Mecca shrine and the and the various gates, the various locations which you are supposed to visit, and then uh, you know the name of the of the pilgrim. So so many of these uh, things were available. Then many other uh, artists or many other visitors who have uh, made uh, images of Mecca and Medina. For, ex for example, there are many Europeans and Christians who, uh, who uh, performed actually pilgrimage uh, uh, hidden, uh, you, know, uh, you know, appearing as Muslim. So, um, so this, uh, for example, this engraving is uh, from 19th century uh, by somebody called D. Anderson. And of course, since we're talking about South Asia, uh, there were several artists who visited uh, Mecca and Medina and, and made these paintings. Even some artists who were connected to the Mughal Empire. 
So this uh, uh, artist named Muhammad Abdullah Naksha Navis, he comes from Delhi and he visits 18, uh, he visits Mecca in 1845. And before that, he has drawn some other pictures or he, in fact, his family uh, is the family of artists and they uh, belong to the royal court, the Mughal court. They were employed with the last Mughal king, uh, Bahadur Shah Zafar. Uh, so uh, Muhammad Abdullah goes to Mecca and he makes this uh, kind of image. I'll show you a close up of that. Uh, these are called nakshas. Nakshas uh, doesn't ne necessarily mean a map, although they look like a map, but naksha or naksh is, is just an image or a diagram of a place or a shrine. And uh, they may not be exactly accurate, but they, 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 they give you a lot of details. There are many other nakshas which have kind of index uh, of, of what uh, location, you know, what, which, which location is what. So there are images like that, uh, which you find. Uh, then uh, there is a photographer from Delhi, India, who visits uh, Mecca and Medina in 1900. Uh, his name is H.A. Mirza. He has, a, he has a shop, a photography shop in Delhi. Um, so, and he is, he's famous for, H.A. Uh, Mirza is famous for picture postcards. You know, this was a time when picture postcards were really in vogue and a lot of people were printing these colorful picture postcards and sending them around. So H.A. Mirza was doing a lot of picture postcards of, uh, of tourist uh, kind of places in India. But then he goes to Mecca and Medina and he takes these uh, about 13, 14 pictures which were printed and uh, uh, you know circulated some of these picture postcards of Mecca and Medina were actually posted from Jeddah to places like uh, uh, places like uh, Paris and Leiden etc but this uh, this particular frame that you see this is a photograph which has been put inside a frame uh, which has uh, some commentaries written in Urdu language and these commentaries are about uh, that uh, that particular place, which is called Naksha Harame Madina Munawwara. And it has some Urdu couplets, some poetry, and it has a very, uh, flow, you know, very, very interesting kind of commentary about what is this place and how do you find this place. And, you know, uh, so there are many other photographs done by H.A. Mirza in 1900. So you can already see that uh, Indian artists, Indian photographers and publishers are uh, you know, uh, producing these kind of images and they are going uh, all around. Then we come to the printing press and especially the color printing press, uh, what we call the uh, chromo lithographs. And uh, the person who pioneered the chromo lithographs in India was Raja Ravi Verma. Uh, he was from Kerala and he uh, started doing these uh, 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 portraits of real people by uh, you know putting them as models and he also did portraits uh, sort of uh, pictures of hindu gods and goddesses so some of these uh, images of his uh, hindu gods and goddesses are available and and, and he gave a, a kind of a human a form to hindu gods and goddesses by using models although he was criticized for that but uh, he did that. So I was wondering whether he did any of the Islamic images and I found uh, a, a few images. So for instance, the, uh, the, this is Makkah Muazzama, which was done by Ravi Verma, Fine Arts, Litho Works. We are not sure whether he actually drew this picture, but it definitely comes from his printing press. And uh, again, it's like a, uh, it's like a pilgrimage uh, uh, image. And you can see uh, there are several, uh, you know, diagrams and several uh, labels that are given. Similarly, an image of Madina Munawwara done uh, uh, by this printing press. Again, a lot of details for people who are visiting uh, this place. Then, uh, there, uh, apart from uh, Ravi Verma, there are other producers, there are other publishers. For example, Hem Chandra Bhargav from Delhi. He does many Islamic uh, images, for example, this Naqshai Karbala e Mawalla. Um, again, Karbala and other, uh, uh, you know, there are some Shia, uh, uh, you know, centric uh, shrines which have been drawn uh, by these uh, images. Now, one thing which I want to just emphasize here that if you see these three images, you will find that they, there is this perspective, there is this three dimensional quality to these images. So Ravi Verma was really a pioneer uh, who, who gave this, this perspective in Indian art. Before him, uh, much of the art, especially the miniature paintings, were being done in a very flat kind of a form. So this you can, you can actually see the perspective, the receding perspective in many of these images. 
so, so some of these uh, Shia uh, shrines, for example, in Najaf in Iraq, uh, done by uh, a printing press called PPC Bombay. Then this shrine of Imam Hussain at Karbala uh, uh, and Iraq, again uh, published by PPC in Bombay. Then you come to this another very large uh, sort of pilgrimage map because you know a lot of people who go for pilgrimage uh, to Mecca, they don't just visit Mecca or Medina, they also go around in many other shrines, some Shia shrines in Iraq, Baghdad, etc., Iran, and even uh, Jerusalem and, and other places. So this uh, map is actually giving you almost 25 holy sites uh, outside, inside as well as outside Hejaz which is published by Bridge Basi. Again, Bridge Basi is a Hindu publisher, but it's, it's very interesting how, uh, you know, this religious uh, pluralism, uh, you can see through these images. Then there is this image of Baitul Muqaddas. Again, details of what all you will find in Baitul Muqaddas is done by J.B. Khanna and company in Madras, which is in South India. Madras is now called Chennai. Um, then the very famous uh, popular image uh, of Burak, which the Prophet Muhammad wrote uh, in his uh, Miraj. Uh, so that, uh, that creature or that uh, being has been drawn uh, a lot in South Asia. Of course, you will find that, that in Africa and other Islamic uh, places also. But uh, you'll see some very interesting backdrop here that the, uh, the person has, the artist has drawn the Pyramid of Giza uh, at the backdrop. So it's, I find it very interesting. And also in the water uh, body that you see, there are, um, you know, lotus flowers. So it's like a mix of South Asia. And even this mosque is a very South Asian kind of uh, dome. And then at the back, uh, you have the Pyramid of Giza. So it's very interesting kind of global uh, imagery that is going on. Of course, as I said, a lot of people were not, a lot of Muslims were not very happy using uh, images. Uh, so they would prefer calligraphy. So a lot of Arabic calligraphy posters have been produced and published in India. And, and uh, basically what they do, they put uh, maybe an image of Mecca or Medina in a small kind of an oval shape and then surrounded by flowers and a and lot of beautiful kind of imagery and then calligraphy somewhere in the middle. There are um, prayers and there are uh, there are talismans uh, which have been written in this manner and, and produced. So this is again from 1930s. Um, then uh, a lot of images are actually about, uh, since a lot of people are going to Mecca for Hajj pilgrimage, so people are, uh, you know, a lot of artists are drawing these images which kind of show the, uh, the, the starting of the journey of the Hajj. So this is an artist uh, named P. Sardar. Now P. Sardar is a very ambiguous kind of a name. One would wonder what is his religious identity. He's a Muslim, but he's also famous for his Hindu images. You know, he's done some exquisite uh, images of Hindu gods and goddesses. So it's a very interesting kind of a, a, a dialogue happening between uh, artists and, and producers of, of different religions uh, in South Asia. P. Sardar also does these images, uh, again, uh, you know, people starting their journey for Hajj pilgrimage. Then uh, another interesting thing which you see in terms of the flow of images or the journey of the images uh, outside India or between India and the rest of the world is these greeting cards, the Eid greeting cards. Um, a lot of Eid uh, Mubarak greeting cards are being produced in India. I mean, I, I did some research and I have not found uh, Eid greeting cards anywhere else before uh, they, they started appearing in India. And Lahore was uh, a very, uh, you know, prolific place where these were being produced. So you see um, many of these Eid greeting cards. And the interesting part is that some of these greeting cards are actually a Christmas greeting card, Christmas uh, or newer, newer greeting card. This is actually produced in Germany uh, originally, uh, minus that Arabic or Urdu uh, stamp. Uh, so it's, it shows a European winter and then it comes to India and somebody stamps Eid Mubarak and Assalamu Alaikum on it and then somebody has written a message. Uh, so this is a Eid, Eid Mubarak Eid card which is being sent from Lahore to Delhi by one brother to another brother. So very interesting kind of uh, you know journey which is happening through Eid cards. Again, um, this Eid card uh, which is probably produced in Europe and, and stamped with this Urdu 
um, uh, calligraphy or Urdu message about Eid, but the the presence of a of a, of a sailing ship kind of represents this journey. It represents the flow of images across the world, across the continents, especially through the the British Empire. Um, you know, many of these images are coming from Europe and being recycled or reused in India or South Asia and then being sent uh, in other places. So I've found uh, many uh, of these. If you go to our website, tasweerghar.net, you will find an entire visual essay uh, which I have done about the Eid greeting cards where you will see the flow of images through uh, Central uh, South Asia. Now, another interesting thing, as, as I was saying that, uh, you know, European images coming into India and being recycled, but here is a reverse of that. This is an Eid greeting card which has been sent from Lahore to somebody in United States uh, in 1942. And uh, the person has uh, strike, uh, struck off the Eid and has written Christmas and New Year. It's interesting, it's um, the, the kind of flow which is happening of images, you know, and it's happening on both sides in both ways. Now, this is another very fascinating image, and, 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 and as I said that I'm going to show you something which connects with Africa also, since you're having a work workshop tomorrow. So this is, I, I found this very fascinating. This is an Eid card produced in Lahore in South Asia. Uh, and somebody from Mombasa, Kenya is sending this card from Mombasa to uh, Germany. Uh, I mean, I just don't know what to say about this image. How did this image, how did this card end up being in Mombasa, Kenya, whether this person actually purchased it in Mombasa or got it from somewhere or got it, somebody from South Asia sent it or what, you know, these are things which need to be researched probably, you know, the journey of these images needs to be worked out. So, so I found these very interesting and very fascinating journeys across. I'm just showing you a close up of, of uh, the, the other side of that. And you can see the, the postage stamp, it says Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, I think that's Tanzania probably. So, um, so because there was a time uh, when when these three countries, there was one postal system for these three countries. I suppose I'm not an expert on African studies, but you can see that somebody and and the person, uh, his name, the person who's sending is Muhammad Hamid Timami. I don't know this Timami doesn't sound like a South Asian name, so maybe this person is from from Mombasa, Kenya. It's, it's a puzzle uh, that one needs to figure out, figure it out. Then there are some images, as I said, that they are being recycled. So this is an image which is showing a historical monument in uh, Italy uh, on one side. On the other side, uh, it's been made, it's been recycled as an Eid card. And then, uh, so the Eid card comes from uh, Lahore and then it goes to Ahmedabad, which is in Gujarat. Uh, in India right now. So, so another shop uh, co called Vakil Book Depot, Muhammad Ali Road, Ahmedabad, which is selling this. So see the journey from Italy to Lahore to Ahmedabad, and then somebody will use it and, and send it across. So it's interesting the way these images are uh, moving across. Okay, we'll come back to, uh, come back to our uh, poster art. Um, so there are a lot of local uh, kind of iconography, local symbols that are being used uh, along with the picture of Mecca and Medina. So you can see that these two uh, children are reading the Quran and at the bottom on the left, there is a uh, there is an incense stick or a, an instinct, ins, incense holder where you can see a little mist coming out of that. And that's a very typically South Asian, Indian, Pakistani kind of a symbol. Uh, so many of these uh, local symbols and local uh, elements are being used. Again, you can see that Mecca and Medina is actually being put inside a little alcove something like a Hindu temple inside a house. You know, in many Hindu homes, they make this little alcove, a little thing in the, uh, you know, uh, and then they put the uh, idols, uh, Hindu idols in that. So the artist has actually tried to imagine an Islamic image in a Hindu kind of perspective. So a lot of very interesting things are happening. And of course, this woman is very, like, she's like a bride, you know, wearing all this uh, jewelry and, 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 uh, kind of bridal outfit. And uh, besides Mecca and Medina, they are also showing, many of these posters are also showing the local uh, Sufi shrines. So for example, this is Ajmer 
Sharif Ajmer uh, has Ajmer in Rajasthan has the uh, the the tomb of a Sufi saint named Mainuddin Chishti. So Mainuddin Chishti is a famous uh, uh, you know sa saint from uh, 12th 13th century, and he's buried here, and a lot of people visit his shrine. And uh, so the the poster also depicts a little small little um, locations which you are supposed to visit when you are on a pilgrimage to this place. And of course, Mecca and Medina are on top, kind of blessing the entire image. And uh, of course, th apart from the shrines, some of the posters also show uh, the saint, the, the po portrait of the saints themselves. So, for example, this one um, is uh, showing these uh, Chishti Sufis. The Chishti order was a uh, was a popular order of Sufis, but among these six people, uh, the, the the top, uh, you know, on the right uh, top uh, hand, uh, the person with a red uh, turban, he is actually Abdul Qadir Jilani, who's buried in Baghdad. So, uh, Abdul Qadir Jilani is considered like a master Sufi uh, of, of uh, by all the Sufis in India. So, you can see that how a public memory about these saints is being uh, depicted through images like this. And then, of course, there are miracles. There are, uh, you know, the, the the Sufis are supposed to kind of um, depict. Uh, they're supposed to conduct miracles and so on. So all these are reflected in these images. Now, I just just before I end, I wanted to show you a few juxtapositions about how certain imagery is actually common between South Asia and Africa. For example, uh, you know, lions and and animals like tigers and lions kind of depict the uh, spiritual power of a Sufi. So here at the bottom, you see an image uh, which is from Lahore, uh, not uh, the South Asian, uh, not the pre-independence Lahore, but this is from Pakistan. So here is a Sufi a saint who is actually riding a lion. Uh, and, and on the top, you see um, a, 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 an image from Africa, uh, where again a Sufi or a marabout is is with uh, with with a, with a lion. So similar um, similar images you will find again. This is from Pakistan. That the bottom one is from Pakistan, and the top one is uh, from Senegal. Uh, you're familiar with uh, uh, you know some of these uh, saints who are there. For example, uh, uh, um, if I'm if I'm right, this is uh, Amadou Bamba, uh, Sheikh Amadou Bamba, who's on the top. And uh, again, he's also shown, this is a wall fresco somewhere in Senegal. And uh, at the bottom, you have this Sayyid Lal Badshah who's, uh, who's in Pakistan. So there are many of these similarities between South Asia and Africa that you would find. Here again, uh, I'm, I'm showing you this image of uh, Burak. The top one is from Africa and the bottom one is from South Asia. So uh, these are uh, sort of connections that need to be looked at. They need to be... Uh, studied, uh, you know, how are the images actually flowing from one continent to another, or is this a totally, a, you know, a, a local artist's imagination, or how these images or how these symbols are, are you know, uh, flowing from one to, to another. I think I'm going to probably end because uh, we, we are coming to a, you know, end of this uh, thing. So again, this is just the last uh, image which shows uh, a saint um, um, the top one from uh, uh, South Asia, uh, the saint is, say, uh, you know, sitting uh, on top of a fish and the bottom one again from, from Africa, uh, pro probably from Algiers, uh, Algeria. Uh, he's also kind of being carried in water through uh, fish. So there are many of these symbols that you will find in both India, uh, in South Asia, as well as African region. And uh, this is what we need to figure out. We need to uh, look at these images and see how the uh, popular imagination and how the popular piety of, of Muslims kind of allows uh, images of this kind and, and diversity of images to thrive in, in, in the, you know, the, the different Islamic countries. So I think this is how I'm going to end this, just to show you one last image of Mecca and Medina and how little pictures, little things have been added to it. So this is a small survey that I showed you about uh, the how South Asian region was a center of production of these images, which have flown, which have, which have traveled all over uh, in different places. So thank you and uh,
we can have a discussion or a questions now. I'm going to uh, end this so that we can see each other. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Yusuf. That was fantastic. It was, uh, it was riveting and it has given me many things to think about and it will be great to invite you here in person at some point when we can travel again. Yes, sure. Yeah, I wonder if you want to show your last slide which had your website so people can easily find it. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, maybe you should do that because I think many people will want to explore some of the other kinds of things uh, that you have done. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, tasveerghar.net, uh, which you can visit. Uh, this is a very uh, vibrant website where we uh, feature a lot of South Asian uh, popular visual culture. When we say popular visual culture, it includes, uh, we obviously avoid the classical forms of art or, or even the contemporary, uh, you know, modern art. We usually, what when we when I say popular, uh, I define popular in terms of uh, mass produced, number one, mass produced uh, art, which has been produced for, for a lot of people, not just one person, and something which has a social life, something which where people interact with an image outside, let's say, uh, an art gallery or a museum, maybe in people's homes and, and streets or public places and so on. So you will find a lot of that material on tasveerghar.net. And uh, we even invite uh, contributions of, uh, you know, essays or, or images uh, about South Asia, about, about popular culture of South Asia. If, if somebody has something, they can contribute images uh, or visual essays uh, to us. Right now, we are running a project uh, about the images of masculinities or masculine uh, kind of popular visual culture in South Asia. So you will see some of those uh, things there. Uh, yeah, great. Thank you very much. So now I would like to invite our roundtable participants to speak. So I will give the floor first to uh, Shobana Shankar. Thank you. Um, thank you, Yusuf. Uh, it's really an amazing collection you've, um, you've been doing and continue because we can actually really see a lot of um, interesting patterns, intriguing patterns, and also, as you say, these amazing angles for future research. Um, and also, um, I think uh, you were, in your written comments, you had talked about this visual vocabulary. We can see it in formation over more than a hundred years in these symbols uh, that we um, identify with. And so also, I think one of the reasons why I'm this presentation is so enjoyable, and I was so fortunate to actually see it in person at Stony Brook, um, is that it's very enriching for all the senses. And I think what devotional art brings out um, is that it really does try to touch all the senses, smell through the flowers, um, you know, uh, visual as well as, um, you know, hearing, sound, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very, it's, it really suggests how religious experience is embodied. Um, it is in, in various parts of our body, not merely as a cerebral ex experience. Um, so I just want to, in the interest of time, make a few comments that touch on things you've said and maybe can raise some questions for discussion if people are interested. The first is, um, you, you know, in the title of your talk that India South Asia at this period, um, you know, going back to the late, uh, to the 19th century becomes this print center. Um, does this have to do with the fact that South Asia is multi-religious and also multi-media already at that time? And I think you answered that, of course, in terms of uh, Muslim, Hindu, uh, even maybe we can see Christian elements. In fact, the lions at the end actually reminded me of some of the Ethiopian lions from the um, Orthodox representations of the, um, of the monarchy. The lions, the scale of the lion's head even uh, suggested to me also from Ethiopian art. Um, so um, 
but also the way in which the devotional cultures work. Uh, Raja Ravi Verma um, in the Kerala mural tradition, there is this um, you know public aspect of of viewing that um, translates to a portable image, but also as you wor as you pointed out, this home based worship and 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 I think the um, the multi religiosity and the uh, multiple expressions of um, of uh, religious devotion, both in public as well as in the domestic sphere, which I wouldn't necessarily call private in places like South Asia, but there's a, there's a, there's an attachment between the public and the private spheres that I think is your, your, your collection really highlights. Um, in addition to the multi religiosity of this, of these forms or their, their evolution and their origins. Um, one of the questions I had was, you know, um, I think about, do you see changing priorities? In other words, does art express what people are doing, but can it also change what people are, are prioritizing in their devotional practices? So for example, I saw in the earlier, um, like say Raja Ravi, the Varma studio, lithographs, uh, no people, right? And we emphasize that point, but by the 1990s, you have different kinds of people. You have a, a devotee, a woman, um, and of course, that's also interesting because Varma's early paintings have a lot of women, but what he does for the Muslim audiences doesn't have people at all. But it's interesting that even perhaps during the time of more and more debates amongst what m Muslim culture will allow, you actually find more people <laughs> than you do in the past. So I was just wondering about if, if this is uh, to express individuals possibility individual piety versus communal piety like that might be expressed by the Hajj uh, but this home home based um, shrine or, or, or a place for quiet reflection prayer etc um, and then uh, I'll just make the uh, yes I'm really interested in how 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 people use these or incorporate these um, devotional art pieces into their home life, into how women, children, men display these uh, these pieces. Because I think this also gives us, um, um, like you said, the social life of these of these uh, of these images um, comes alive. But also that this may actually be changing in the way people demonstrate their their piety. Um, and the last point, um, the intertextuality. You, you talked about this in terms of uh, the relationship between these kinds of images and film, for example. Um, and of course, you know, a lot has been written about Indian film in, on the African continent, um, as well as in other parts of the world. Um, so the intertextuality between the visual image, visual religious, religious visual expressions, but also film. For example, at the beginning of, film, of, of Indian films or South Asian films, you often find some kind of religious um, blessing given or, or a religious image. So I wondered if any of these uh, uh, art forms found them way, their way into films and then in films also becoming popular in other parts of the world, if we might see an intertextual play, as well as um, architecture, of course, through the early 20th century, mosque building really takes off and you have these images of mosques uh, being proliferated through this kind of art. Um, and, you know, you alluded at the beginning at, to, to, um, to the the, the problematic or the, the idea that this is a debate, heavily debated and even censored issue. So a last question, but maybe not the most interesting one is, um, does mass production of devotional art actually bring into, the, bring into more being forces of censorship? We sort of associate censorship and, um, and um, authority in relation to texts, but do images actually bring more um, tension and the, the, the power to censor? So I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shobana. Let me invite Ali um, to speak now. Thank you so much. Uh, that was really exquisite, Yusuf, and thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. I want to see if I can begin by um, sharing something, an image. 
Um, so Musa, if I can. Yes, you can share. Just okay. click on the share screen button on your. Yeah. So I wanted to begin with this um, because as a child growing up in Lahore, Pakistan, I remembered the time when um, pilgrims to Makkah and Medina would bring back this view master. And as children, we would pass this view master to our friends and others, and it was a prized possession. But the experience was very tactile. It was sensory, but it was also transformative because it created this uh, moral sensibility of longing that you wanted to go to the same places where the pilgrims had come from. And you, that sensibility was produced through this tactile engagement with this object. And one would look through, uh, look, look into the view master, but, but it would seem as if one was looking at a faraway distant land. Um, so I'm gonna stop the screen share, but that was just um, something I, your, your PowerPoint slide which you shared with us earlier made me think of. I want to, I think, structure my comments around three themes. And the first one is the question of democratization that is often the democratization of knowledge that is often linked with print um, culture or print technology. And what are the implications of your sources for, for um, that democratization of what Jamal Ilyas has called the aesthetic social imagination? And I'll come back to that. My second point will be um, picking up on Shobana's last point um, about censorship, but also intra-Muslim contestation of religious norms uh, around the around figural representation. And my third um, set of my third comment will be about visual print culture and secularization. So first, I think that. In his book, uh, Alif, is, Alif is for Allah, Childhood, Emotion, and Visual Culture in Islamic Society, Jamal Ilyas gives us a fascinating um, key concept called aesthetic social imagination, by which he displaces the philosophical preoccupation with high art, but also with the aesthetic subject as, um, as just disinterested contemplation of beauty because um, how people use images and how we relate to images is not as disinterested subjects contemplating the sublime, but, but we use images for world making um, purposes and images are sources of pleasure and images are sources of entertainment. They, they are also divisive. Um, so I think that I want to ask the question, not just for Yusuf, but for our broader discussion, did print, did visual print culture democratize what Jamal Elias has called aesthetic social imagination of Muslims? And so printed images must also have fed into the attractability of Muslim South Asia's sacred geography. And many of the uh, images that you show Yusuf they, they do construct a sacred geography. And this is one of um, the things that Shahzad Bashir has recently emphasized in a piece called India as a Sufi space time in the work of Jamali of Delhi, where he studies the Sufi imagination of India as a dwelling place and an element within the larger geography pertaining to Islam. Yet, if the repurposing of the Sufi imagination of India as Islamic serves modern nationalist agenda, Bashir, Shahzad Bashir, emphasizes the need to look at the alternative ideological aspirations of pre-modern Sufi sources, because they did not have this nationalist agenda by imagining India as an Islamic space-time. So in his sources, he emphasizes, quote, India constituted the Islamic world, such that travel to other regions helped solidify their identification with India or with a city such as Delhi, end of quote. 
but I think that this raises the question that how is the local and the translocal, call it ummah based instead of global, so how is the local and the translocal negotiated in these visual materials? And I think it, for me at least, it calls to mind what um, the art historian and critic Kajri Jain describes as epistemically disjunct. So there, so Indic Islam, South Asian Islam is epistemically disjunct, yet performatively networked. Right, so it's performatively networked in a broader world, but in terms of some of the rituals and the institutions of South Asian Islam and the shrine-based culture and the various ideological or orientations, it is epistemically disjunct from an ummah-based network. So, so that's the first theme. Um, second, picking up on Shabana's last point, I want to um, connect this to intra-Muslim contestations of religious norms. And I want to ask that were the producers in the early part of the 20th century, were they pushing back against a certain iconoclastic cen censure of such visual culture? And you talk about this at the beginning of your excellent book, Muslim Devotional Art in India. But this iconoclasm is itself being displaced by digital, digital technology and the so-called traditionalist Muslims who still ban printed figural images seem to have embraced audiovisual media. And tomorrow I'll talk about the proliferation of the Tablighi Jamaat on YouTube, but it's really ironic that um, at the beginning of the 20th century, you had a heated debate between Sayyid Suleiman Nadwi, who was all for film and photography, and Mufti Muhammad Shafi of the Deoband Seminary, who did not approve of the printed image. But that debate changes in post-coloniality, where his son, Mufti Muhammad Shafi's son, Mufti Muhammad Taqi Usmani, has said that film and uh, audiovisual sources and digital technology is, is a green light because the moving image is not the same thing as, as the as the tasweer because there's no fixity to the moving image. And so uh, video is, is permissible, but the printed image is still not permissible unless it's for like passports. So I want to see if, if the producers and you said some of them were non-Muslims, but um, the Muslim and the non-Muslim producers of this print culture, were they pushing back against um, this, this type of iconoclasm that defines um, the Barelvi and the Deobandi Hanafi jurist, juristic dis discourse of the early 20th century? And the last point is the relationship between this visual print culture and secularization. In a sense, these visual images refuse the colonial division of society into the religious and the secular. But they do so by dragging down the supernatural into the secular or the ordinary, even the worldly when we consider the market economy in which these images serve consumer needs. I'm thinking here alongside Kajri Jain, who points out that the gods in the bazaar, quote, highlight the tensions between traditions of secular and devotional reason, between the ocular centric treatment of images as vehicles of linguistic ideation and the blindness of faith or the power of facticity, end of quote. So, I, I don't want to say that the the that this visual culture it fits neatly into the way that uh, colonialism imagines uh, the division of, of of social space, but I think that it displaces that binary of the private, public, or the religious, the secular, by by localizing or putting in ordinary usage something that is evocative of the transcendent. And I'll stop there, but thank you so much for this rich body of work. Thank you very much, Ali. So Yusuf, I wonder if you would like to respond to 
uh, Shobana and Ali before we open it up uh, to the audience for other questions and comments. Okay, uh, maybe I can say a few things. I don't know how specific I, I would be in terms of uh, responding. Uh, first of all, uh, there was this uh, idea of uh, whether these uh, images are evolving in any way. Are they? Are they? Has there been any change in terms of, you know, like uh, what began by somebody like the Ravi Verma Press, and then later on, what happens? So there are a lot of changes, of course, that are going on over the over these last uh, hundred years, and I can't really you know, survey the entire hundred years, but, but at least if we look at the images from, let's say, 1910s and 30s and coming all the way to, let's say, 1950s, I see many changes. For example, the, the whole idea of the depiction of human figure, uh, of course, right in the beginning, people were reluctant about uh, making pictures of human, uh, human body. Um, so, and, and I have even seen um, the, the image of Mecca Shrine, which is actually a copy of a photograph. So the artist has actually looked at a photograph and made uh, a, a painting. In the photograph, you can see people, you can see the pilgrims, uh, of course, but in the painting, uh, those people have been deleted. So, so there is a deliberate attempt. I mean, otherwise, everything is exactly the same. If you if you compare the two images, it's there in my book also, I think. So there's definitely a deliberate attempt. And uh, I'm not sure whether Ravi Verma was uh, was the artist of, of some of these Islamic uh, paintings because he probably died in 1906 or, or some, somewhere around there. And these images, uh, his press continued to be to, to function and, and the images continued to be produced. So um, we are not sure whether he actually uh, drew them, but there is definitely as we move on from uh, beyond 1930s, then slowly we start seeing some human figures. And that too, not in the context of Mecca or Hajj pilgrimage, but the local images. For example, the local Sufi shrines, the local uh, pilgrimage centers. So there uh, you see maybe a couple of people. For example, there's a very interesting uh, pilgrimage map uh, of a shrine in Maharashtra near Bombay, uh, where uh, you're supposed to get off at a, at a railway station, uh, which is drawn at the bottom of the image. And the shrine is at the top of a hill. And there's a very interesting uh, crisscrossing road, which goes from the bottom to the top. So the artist actually draws uh, pilgrims who are, you know, trudging along and going all the way up there. So there are some images like that which has appeared. And then, of course, slowly um, around 1950s or so, you, you start uh, seeing the, 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 uh, the, the portraits of, uh, of Sufi, Sufis. And the, another interesting thing that I found was that, you know, I've also looked at how the partition of India how that affected the creation of these images, especially the Islamic images. Of course, in terms of the Hindu images or the Indian nationalistic images, there is a continuity uh, uh, which you will see. But in terms of the Islamic images after partition, after the creation of Pakistan, what happens? Uh, I was very fascinated to see that in Pakistan, a lot of Sufi saints have been drawn, their portraits have been drawn, which the Indian artists, uh, the Indian producers have not done. So there is a very interesting thing happening that most of the Indian publishers who have, many of them happen to be Hindus, they are very reluctant about uh, drawing human figures because they, they don't want to hurt the sensibilities of their clients. They don't want to hurt anybody. So they, they don't uh, put any human figures. They don't put any any kind of anything which might... Uh, one of the images which I showed you in which there are six Sufis sitting, of course, those six are uh, not exactly contemporaries. They they were in a, in a same silsila, but they come from different uh, time zones, I mean, times. Um, so uh, somebody asked uh, this producer, this was, a, this was Bridge Basi who produced that image showing the six Sufi saints. Uh, so somebody asked them, in fact, there was a court case which was put uh, on this publisher that why did you draw these uh, Sufis? So uh, he's, he actually, uh, this, um, uh, the producer, uh, Bridge Basi, they actually defended by saying that they, all these six belong to the same silsila. They come in the same order. That is how we've, we've, we've done that. And they, there is, 
actually a precedence to that image of six Sufis, you, you will find a miniature painting from the Mughal period from 17th century onwards. There are several versions of that miniature painting where you see these six uh, saints sitting and having a conversation, even though they are not contemporaries. So there are very interesting things happening in terms of the Hindu producers and the Muslim um, uh, kind of uh, uh, users. Uh, Shobhana also asked about the you know, intertextuality in terms of whether there is anything happening between the different media, for example, the cinema and, and, and posters. So definitely, you know, many of the artists of these posters are actually also doing the billboards, the, the what we call the hoardings or the billboards, the cinema billboards, which were being done in the 60s and 70s. So many of these artists started doing the wall paintings and the wall frescoes and the billboards and they 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 did the poster art uh, as well so there is a connection there and uh, there's a very famous there's a very popular image of a uh, of a muslim woman praying you know like holding her hand like that uh, which has been repeated so often in these images and that actually comes from cinema or maybe it's the other way around or both ways uh, because uh, many movies were produced in Bombay, which were called the Muslim socials, where you see the, the Muslim woman, uh, you know, holding her hand uh, in a prayer poster. So, so there is a lot of this uh, intermedia or intertextuality happening between, uh, between these uh, uh, things. Um, I, th I don't know whether I, I, I talked about the censorship, uh, but of course, these producers, the publishers, they, they, they are conscious of of what they need to be careful about. I mean, there are Hindu producers, Hindu publishers in India who are doing Qurans. You know, there is this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, there are there are producers who are doing, who publishers who were producing some beautiful Qurans and those Qurans were going all around uh, South Asia, even all the way to Afghanistan and Iran. Uh, and, and they had to be careful. They had to make sure that there are no mistakes, there are no errors and nobody's feelings get hurt. So there is a kind of a self-censorship obviously going on and I've never come across any uh, any kind of conflict or any kind of social issue between these producers and the users in terms of any, um, any kind of, uh, uh, you know, objectionable uh, image being produced by Hindu producers, which, which, which would have a, which would have an issue uh, in, in, in these. Yeah, um, Ali, you showed that that view master uh, that thing. Yeah, I've, I've actually mentioned that probably somewhere. That was also something that I I remember when my grandparents came from Mecca and they also brought these and and the whole idea of the looking at an image in three dimension used to give you that feeling that you, that you are actually there and it would sort of call you out, you know. And there, you know, it's a very interesting thing if you if you read uh, the pilgrimage uh, travelogue by this guy called uh, Eldon Rutter, who's a British uh, British pilgrim uh, who came in 1925 to Mecca. And this 1925 was the time when, uh, you know, the uh, the Saud family had already attacked uh, Hijaz and they had destroyed a lot of things. And there was a lot of terror, you know, a lot of people were not visiting, not doing the pilgrimage that year. But Elder Rutter manages to come and he there are two things which he mentions one is about the destruction of the of the of the graveyards the other thing he talks about is the posters the images which of mecca and medina which were being produced in uh, turkey and he says that they are so beautiful they are they are so attractive that they actually attract more pilgrims to come to the shrine so i think that is a very fascinating thing that these images despite the fact that there is a tension whether one should use the images or not use the images but there is a there is a whole uh, there is a whole uh, you know uh, kind of a, a, a beckoning uh, you know this beckoning thing is there even in in south asia in terms of the sufi shrines you know there are many of these images of the sufi shrines are actually used to to beckon the people to call the people to the shrine they attract when you put a, a shrine of the Ajmer uh, Sufi somewhere in Delhi or somewhere in Bengal, you know, people see it and they are attracted towards it. Even, you know, people are now using videos for that, for the same purpose. There are music videos being produced to beckon the, the, the pilgrims towards the shrine. So I think that's another uh, interesting role uh, that these uh, images uh, uh, 
produce. I'm not sure how much I can uh, answer uh, uh, further, but uh, there is definitely a very interesting ecology between the producers of the images and the users. I've spoken to some of these, for example, this producer called uh, JB Khanna and Company in Madras in Chennai. And he says that uh, we depend on the feedback of the people from the street, like the street hawker, we ask them what is selling more. And then we produce those kind of images. And, and so they keep recycling, they, they keep rehashing. Uh, of course, I mean, sadly, new images are not being commissioned to the artists. And, and today, I don't really find any new artists who are actually doing these kind of poster art. They're now, producers are mostly depending on the past images. They are now recycling. They are actually using Photoshop uh, on the computer to, to re-design uh, and, you know, like something which was rectangular, something which was like uh, vertical, which has been done into a horizontal and then so on and so forth. So a lot of recycling is happening, but it's all depending on the feedback that they find from the street level. So it's a very interesting kind of a ecology of image production that is going on. And I don't know whether there, it's, it's international, but definitely it, it, it's, uh, it's happening within South Asia. I even visited Malaysia once uh, and I was asking somebody that, you know, are there any popular uh, Islamic images there? And this person said, oh, I will show you something very rare, you know, something that you will not find anywhere. And when he brought the image, it was actually something, it was a copy of something produced in India. So, I mean, it's going all the way to Indonesia and Malaysia. So it's a very interesting kind of ecology uh, that is that is um, happening. I think I'll stop here and maybe uh, let someone else, if the, if the other people from the audience want to ask anything. Yes, thank you very much, um, Yusuf. And so now those in the audience who would like to ask questions, um, I see one question here from uh, Aishvarya Thakur, who writes, has there been a change in visual vocabulary of popular Islamic art with locus of Islamic authority shifting between the Arabian Peninsula to Turkey? Well, I'm not sure whether I can answer that. Um... Uh, maybe if, if, if we are talking about the political situation, the political Islamic global uh, kind of situation, I would probably take the uh, take it back to the times of, um, let's say, uh, um, you know, the, the Gulf War, for instance. Gulf War was a time 1990s and then the second Gulf War, which affected the poster art in South Asia in some way. And I've seen uh, how uh, people like Saddam Hussein and even Osama bin Laden wore, uh, their images were used as heroes, as Islamic heroes. And before that, I could see images of somebody like uh, Yasser Arafat from Palestine. So some of those images, some of those uh, Islamic heroes have been used in, in South Asian images um, in South Asia, of course. Um, and in Pakistan, of course, there is, uh, you know, you can see images of, for example, Bhutto and Ziaul Haq and, and Benazir and all these political uh, heroes uh, which have been drawn along with uh, whether Sufi saints or along with the images of Mecca and Medina and Quran and the babies, you know, the babies uh, praying and the, and the beautiful women praying. So all that has been used in, in South Asian poster art, definitely. But in terms of the recent, more recent global uh, uh, phenomenon, I'm not sure I have, because now things have changed drastically, even in terms of the medium, you know, now poster art, uh, you will probably see the posters or calendars in rural South Asia and rural India, but in the urban India, urban South Asia, uh, even the medium is changing. Of course, now the digital media, the electronic, the mobile phone has taken uh, the place of the poster and calendar in big way. But apart from that, uh, even in terms of the printed material, now you see these three-dimensional 3D posters and some plastic material and then some shiny uh, gold, uh, golden and silver kind of shiny material. A lot of very interesting new technology, new printing things have come. 
uh, which are being sold. I mean, people still want to put something on their walls. Uh, not everything is digital. So in terms of the medium, a lot of medium, a lot of technology has changed, but I'm not sure uh, whether the, the, the political uh, scenario or the political thinking has entered. I'm not sure about Pakistan, maybe it has, because I, I don't see, I don't, I don't see Pakistani poster art on a very regular basis, but I, I uh, observe uh, Indian poster art uh, more regularly and I don't see much change uh, in terms of the political uh, situation. Um, but medium wise, yes, definitely. And, and if you go into the electronic medium, the, 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 what you see on the mobile phone or the videos being produced, that is another, that is a completely different ball game altogether. I mean, one needs to study what's happening in the devotional video, devotional music videos. Thank you. There is a comment from Mohsen Ibrahim. If he would like to say it, I have unmuted him. Or yeah, maybe Musa. I don't see. I don't. Um... Hello. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Mine. Uh, I, I have already written it. It's just a comment, saying that uh, when I was growing up in Kano, Nigeria, even yes. though I'm not from, I'm, I'm, I don't live there anymore now. Yeah. I, I was quite familiar with some of the. Uh, images you shared, uh, they were so popular at that time. Uh -huh. But now, you know, with the uh, rise of super, I mean, uh, selfism, which discourages, you know, making such portraits, yeah. the pictures, uh, the images are disappearing. I don't know how is the situation in India, because I know uh, I lived there in, in Punjab mm -hmm. between 2013 and 2015. Uh, the, so I know the pictures were very popular, but I rarely uh, saw Muslim images, more of Hindu and uh, Sikh uh, images. I don't know the situation with the Muslims, mm -hmm. because almost globally, Salafism is, uh, you know, changing the, uh, the trend of how Muslims uh, are behaving and seeing uh, things uh, that were hitherto common and normal to them. So mm -hmm. I don't know if it is a question, it's more of a comment. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, definitely. That's nice that you, you were there in Punjab. Actually, in today's Punjab in India, there are hardly any Muslims uh, because most of the Muslims uh, migrated to Pakistan uh, in 1947. So uh, much of the Punjab right now, except maybe one, uh, one town, uh, Malir, Malir Kotla, most of the Punjab doesn't have many Muslims, so you will not find uh, um, those, uh, those images. Although Punjab is full of uh, Sufi shrines, there are a lot of Muslim Sufi shrines, there are a lot of mosques which are like, sort of abandoned now. I mean, there's an entire um, um, you know, story about how the Sufi shrines in Punjab were actually uh, um, appropriated by the low caste Hindus or the Dalits and then, you know, they have kind of maintained it. But uh, outside Punjab, definitely you will find a lot of Muslim images, maybe not in the big cities, but in the smaller towns, in the villages in India, in South Asia, you will still find a lot of uh, Muslim images. I mean, sometimes even I am not familiar with uh, with what's happening in the village level because there are local printing presses which are producing those images and recycling those images, and especially around the Sufi shrines. Because, you know, Sufi shrines, the, the what we call the Darga or the uh, Maqbara, uh, uh, Mazar. So th th these Mazars are visited by a lot of poor people, a lot of people who have some problem, some economic problem or health problem, a social problem. They visit, uh, they visit the Sufi shrine for a solution, to find a solution. And uh, when they visit, uh, of course, they come back with some souvenir or some gift and some of the gifts are these uh, these pictures and they bring those gifts and they put them in their homes or they visit they even gift it to uh, to their friends and let me tell you the sufi shrines are not visited only by muslims a large number of hindus also hindus and sikhs also visit the sufi shrines and that's why many of these images are also used by a lot of non muslims so that's an interesting uh, uh, kind of uh, thing that uh, it's still alive uh, very much alive in india
So can we say Salafism does, has not affected yeah, the popularity said, of the images yeah, wow. in India? Yes, yes, yes. Wahhabism and Salafism is very much popular, very much there, in, in especially in the big towns, big uh, big cities. There are centers. There are these uh, jam tablig, you know, the tablighi jamaat and the and the Salafis and the Wahhabis. They have their own uh, centers. They have their own madrasas, and and their their influence is definitely there. And and you know. In the past, when people used to go to uh, Hajj uh, pilgrimage, they would come back filled with this uh, with this spiritual kind of uh, uh, kind of knowledge and and spiritual kind of um, um, sort of wisdom. But now, uh, now when they come back, they come back completely whitewashed, you know, completely brainwashed uh, of of their of their past uh, hybrid past. They come back uh, a very uh, sanitized Muslim. Uh, they don't want to. I mean, before going for Hajj, they used to participate in all these rituals, all these visiting of the Sufi shrines. But when they come back, they are completely cleaned up because the, this, the influence of Mecca, the influence of Saudi Arabia, is such on them that they they do not want to, uh, you know, go back to their uh, this kind of hybrid past. So that's another uh, Im impact that you see. And of course, the more educated, uh, the more emancipated Muslims in India, they're also turning towards the Salafi and the Wahhabi uh, ideology. But uh, I would say that um, the Sufi culture has not died mainly because of the po poverty, because of the poor people who still want to visit. They, it, is their desire, it is their need to visit a Sufi shrine and uh, whatever they get out of that, but they definitely, uh, they get something which they probably do not get from, let's say, a mosque. So the Sufi shrine plays a big important role in their, in their social life, in their, uh, you know, solving of their problems or whatever. So, 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 so it will remain alive, I, I think, uh, even though, even if the, um, the Salafi ideology, uh, influences them. Thank you very much, Yusuf. I'm afraid that we are we have run out of time. Unfortunately, already Shobana Shankar had to sign off because she has to teach. So I would really like to thank you, Yusuf. That really was fantastic. It was, yeah, it really was wonderful. And I think that we could have had you speak for much longer. And I yeah. think we could have a conversation for many hours. Yeah. And I really do hope that you will be able to come for our next in-person event here at the University of Florida, where we ha will have this institute, where we will be inviting people working on issues related to media. And it would be really great if you could spend uh, time with us, our students and the other scholars here. So thank you to you and to Ali and to Shobana. And I want to give the last word to Musa Ibrahim, who will say a few words about the workshop tomorrow, which I hope some of you will be able to join. Okay, thank you very much, Ben. And also thank you everyone for coming to today's presentation, which is you know, very fantastic. And we hope that you will join us tomorrow for our workshop, which starts at 10 a.m. Florida time. So it depends on where you are joining us from. Uh, we will start with uh, Laura Fair presentation on faith, cinema, and fun in Tanzania. And also Hassan Nzobu will talk about Muslim women preachers in Ghana. Frederick Mordo will talk about Islam and Muslims in Togo State on press. Lasani Wadrewago will also talk about preaching dissension on viral social media and uh, Adimian will talk about uh, Tablighi Islam on social media. So the event will culminate into Baraza with a talk by uh, Abdullah Uba Adamu on uh, rap and uh, hip hop and Islamic public culture in Northern Nigeria. So we hope you will all be there. Thank you again for coming and see you tomorrow. Thank yeah, you, thank everyone. You, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks again, Yusuf. Yeah, thanks. Bye bye. Yeah, goodbye.